Here's Russ Baker. Thank you, uh, anybody who figured out that I was speaking. Uh, everybody I ran into thought the conference was over or something, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I'm, what I'm afraid of is I'm going to start and then people are going to come in late and then they're going to say, they're going to get up, you've seen this before, they go to the microphones and then they say, I don't know if you said this because I was late, but okay. it's one of my favorite things. All right, uh, so let's start sort of slowly here and kind of ease into this because then I will go through like a zillion slides, but they, I hope, will not be too taxing for you. Um, I know these are long conferences and everybody's probably glad to go home and I would like to say that I don't have many things to say but I, I do have a lot of things to say. I had certain things I thought I was going to say and then I spent uh, four days this week at the National Archives where I found a bunch of interesting new documents. Uh, some of those documents will be up on the screen. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see them. Uh, otherwise I will try to explain what they say. They include uh, Alan Dulles's own notes from the Warren Commission uh, where he's actually correcting uh, drafts of the report and he's changing things and he's rewriting and uh, very, I think, revealing uh, uh, what he was about. Uh, and I want to actually start by thanking the organizers of this event and the AARC for what they do. I want to thank all of you for what you do because uh, speaking as a so-called professional journalist, we couldn't do the work that we do uh, in this area uh, without you. And uh, in fact, in my upcoming book, which will be on the Kennedy assassination, I'm planning to have a chapter about the research community because I think it's such an exceptional uh, uh, occurrence in American history that you people even exist, I think is something absolutely Staggering. Uh, you are the Tom Paines of today. You truly are. Personally, um, I try to remain agnostic and flexible and open to new discoveries and interpretations. Uh, one of the things I discovered, I'm a sort of a recent uh, participant in this arena, only about less than a decade, nothing compared to many of you. Uh, I discovered that there was a lot of fracturing going on here and a lot of disagreements and so forth, but it's kind of an argument on the head of a pin, really, isn't it? Because uh, most of you agree more than you disagree, and if you compare what you all think to uh, what the uh, establishment has been putting out, uh, you really ought to be concentrating on the common ground that you have, which is quite substantial. So. It seems to me to find the plot in this whole thing, and this is what my new book will be about, you have to look for patterns and you have to look for connections and you have to try to figure out if they're random or if they actually mean something. Um, and I think that, I'm not saying that Oswald's not important, I think he is important, I think you want to look at him, but I think if you look only at him or too much at him to the exclusion of other things, you make a mistake. I think that his purpose was to draw your attention. I think that it was a little bit like a magic act where you're looking over here and meanwhile they got the sleight of hand going on over here or they're picking your pocket over here. And I think it's important to look at Oswald but I think it's important to look at other things. And I noticed the other day uh, uh, Buell Frazier was here and uh, people were asking him all sorts of questions and he was, seemed to me, running out the clock a little bit with irrelevant stories, although maybe just what people do, but they weren't really that interesting. And I don't know if you heard my question to him, but I wanted to know, when did you start working at the Texas School Book Depository? And how long had you worked there before uh, Oswald? And how did you find out about it? Because there's a chain of events which result in Lee Harvey Oswald being in that building so that he can shoot the president. Now, how is this not important? Well, Oswald got there because Buell Frazier was there before him. And so this is the kind of work that I try to do. And by the way, I may forget to say this later. Um, I welcome uh, any of you who are good researchers, uh, who are not trying to uh, 
uh, uh, just really want to do good, meaningful work to work with me. Uh, I'm trying to build a whole team. I unfortunately uh, don't have much in the way of resources. Uh, so I look for people who believe in this and think it's important and want to be involved. We could talk a little bit more about that. But I think it's important to work together because there's so many people. I mean, if I asked how many of you have written a book, are writing a book, think you ought to write a book. I, I suspect it's everybody here. And so the problem becomes we're not listening sufficiently to each other. And I'm actually going through a process now, and I will tell you, I have a decent library of JFK books. I haven't read most of them, because if I spent my time reading the books, I couldn't do my reporting. <laughs> and so I'm trying to solve that. I'm reading some of the books, and I'm bringing in other people who have read these other books and really have sort of inhaled them and know them very, very well, so we can take into account uh, what people like Bill Simpich have done, very, very important work. I'm hoping Bill will work with me on my project. OK, wonderful, because he already knows all that stuff, and then we don't have to duplicate that. Very, very important. Um, OK, so uh, look beyond Oswald. Warren Commission. Well, I thought that that was what this conference was about, the Warren Commission, so I prepared something about the Warren Commission. Silly me, because I could have brought one of my old talks on something else, because I see we're talking about everything under the sun related to JFK, which is OK. I don't mind that. But um, I am going to talk about the Warren Commission, so please indulge me. 2020 hindsight, it's easy to say they screwed up. It's easy to say the HSCA screwed up. It's very important to distinguish what we know from what they knew and what they could have known. What I'm looking for when I look at the Warren Commission is clear signs of malfeasance, misfeasance. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not so interested that they didn't do certain things or didn't seem to pay attention to certain things because we don't know if those things mattered or not. They, you know, as somebody said, Blakey, uh, one of Blakey's people from the HSCA yesterday said Blakey had a report to write. By the way, I'm sorry he's not here because I have some things to. Oh, you are there. Good. Nice to see you, Mr. Blakey. Um, uh, and so, uh, so he had a report to write, and I mean, I, I think that's true. You know, he, he's an accomplished gentleman with a very distinguished record, and you know, you take this is work. And when you're given work to do, that's what you do. His job was to uh, run an organization and produce a report. And it is true, the Warren Commission also was supposed to produce a report. OK, so let's give them the benefit of the doubt, and then we can start going after them on some other things. Um, and also, I'm going to show you some things from the archives. Very dusty, by the way, if my voice sounds scratchy. I, I was inhaling Alan Dulles's dust. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I can tell you, I, I wore a mask the last day. Pretty rough. OK. Um, one thing I discovered about the Warren Commission was the extent of the compartmentalization. This is very important. Uh, with my book project, I am trying to keep it minimally compartmentalized. I do ask everybody to sign non-disclosure agreements. But I'm trying to not do too much compartmentalization because when you compartmentalize, you make mistakes. Because other people, when I wrote Family of Secrets, I showed it to a lot of people and I said, is there anything wrong with this? Do you see things that are wrong? The results are much, much better. But the Warren Commission compartmentalized. Everybody was compartmentalized from everybody. The, uh, the commissioners were compartmentalized from each other. They didn't have a lot of interaction. They rarely met. Uh, when there were commissioners there, there were only a few of them. So most of them missed most of it. Uh, the, there was only one person there who didn't have a job and had all the time in the world on his hands. And do you know who that was? Alan Dulles, who'd been fired by Kennedy, okay, and the head of the CIA. So he had all this time, and he was often there, not always, even sometimes he wasn't there. Uh, and then there was the, uh, the, the staff who would interview people, and often it would be a staffer and one person sitting there and nobody else, and so who knows what went into that because they actually talked to the uh, witnesses off the record before they went on the record. So you've got quite a potentially adulterated process there. Um, and then, of course, the staffers didn't talk much to each other, and this caused even more problems, as we will see in a few minutes. Um, also, I want to say, uh, it's easy to say uh, in this whole process, well, uh, so-and-so didn't like so-and-so, and therefore, they couldn't have worked together. 
the FBI didn't like the CIA, so I hear this all the time, they couldn't have been involved together in this, but that's just wrong. Uh, plenty of people who don't like each other, I work together, and probably this conference is a, an example of that. You just, you know, you swallow it, you do what you can to deal with really annoying people or people you think are trying to undermine you. You try to work with them as best as you can when you need to. And frankly, the, although they talk about the fighting between them, there's a tremendous amount of cooperation between the FBI and the CIA, plus the fact that the CIA had undercover people working in the FBI, and the FBI had the reverse. So it's all one big happy family, I guess. And double and triple agents at that. Okay, let's start looking at the slides. Okay, I found this today. I kind of love this. Don't get in the way. Civilian control of the military. I think this sort of says it all. The dirty work fell to Deputy Defense Secretary Roswell Gilpatrick. He's going to figure in what I'm going to be talking about. On Sunday afternoon, he drove to the uh, Observatory Hill to fire this guy, Admiral George Anderson. Anderson was stunned. So was most of the Navy. This is just shortly before the Kennedy assassination. Quote, a military man has really got to bow to this Kennedy crowd, said an admiral who was close to Anderson. Uh, guys who get in their way get knocked off. I'm sure that's what he meant, not something similar. Okay, um, one of the things that I discovered about the Warren Commission, and I hope this will demonstrate this as we go through the slides, is that you've got to lump the Warren Commission together with big business, big labor, as constituted by unions that were heavily uh, corrupted by organized crime, uh, the legal establishment, the judiciary, lawyers, and so forth, uh, the government, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower had just warned us about. That's quite a big deal. We all know about that, but think about what a big deal that is. I mean, could you imagine Obama or Eric Holder warning us about the thing that they were in the midst of? I mean, it's really a remarkable thing in American history, a really a singular statement, tremendous import. Uh, and then, of course, the mob, uh, or as I like to say when you put these all together, business as usual in the good old USA. Um, and I think it's important with all this to keep coming back to the big picture because we get caught in the minutia, we get down into the weeds, it's important to get into the weeds, find those bullets and so on, but then you've got to bring them back and you've got to say, now what does this all mean? Very, very important. And why this all matters. Why does this all matter? Well, uh, I will propose to you at the conclusion uh, that, uh, uh, that this country has never been the same since the assassination of John F. Kennedy. It took me a long time. Some of you have copies of my book I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, that was uh, what I knew then. I, everything I said in there I think is correct. I was cautious. Some people have criticized me for being cautious. I didn't draw too many conclusions. I simply presented documented evidence. I think it was obvious when you read it what uh, one could conclude, but I was careful. Uh, I now have done enough more research that I think it's safe to say, in my own estimation, that what we saw was essentially a coup d'etat, that what we saw was uh, uh, the elements of the establishment who had supported similar coups, and this is all not in dispute all over the world, decided that when the stakes were the highest in the United States, there came a point where the risks were worth it, and it was necessary, they believed, to do this. Now, um, there are two parts, of course, to the assassination. There's the killing of the president, and then there's what comes after. I focus more on the cover-up, because I think it is in the cover-up that you can find the architects of the hit. Now, uh, here's the Warren Commission. I talked talk to you about the compartmentalization. I'm going to be focusing on one of the senior counsel, Albert Jenner. I think he's a microcosm, but he also was, to me, the, the most important staff member in terms of the work that he was assigned to do, and I believe that was deliberate. 
But the way I got started with all this stuff, let me see, I don't know if these slides will coordinate. Okay, you probably can't even read these. Um, this is a document I found this week in the National Archives. They asked each of the staff members, and uh, Mr. Blake, I think you'll find this interesting. I, I can't imagine you tasked them the same way or were, would have accepted this response. They had everybody write what their objectives were. You know, you, when you assign people, you say, my objectives are to do such and such, and you say, right, there is some kind of agreement here, go ahead. Well, they actually write in here that our objective is to prove that there is no conspiracy. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, the, uh, we can go closer and look at the words, and we don't have time, but that's basically what they say, that Oswald uh, acted alone, that he and Ruby had nothing to do with each other. So that's their objective going into this thing in January of 1964. Um, I think I have some long-distance glasses here. <laughs> I was given these when I became a CIA uh, asset. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way, so I don't want to be using them. Well, think no such luck. OK, so I don't know what this says. Uh, this is uh, Alan Dulles, uh, and he's marking up uh, I believe it's Alan Dulles, he's marking up a chapter and he's coming up with his whole new ending. And I'll just summarize since you can't really read this stuff, but basically uh, there's, here's a Rankin, the, uh, the, the head of the uh, commission staff, saying, yeah, you know, I like Alan Dulles' way he rewrote the, uh, you know, there's a bunch of good stuff in here. I don't really like his ending though. Well, the reason he didn't like his ending was, you know, for a guy, Dulles, who ran uh, this intelligence organization with these very sober, supposedly, reports, that what's astonishing is the purple prose, uh, it's totally, inappropriate. I can tell you as a former journalism professor, I would have never allowed any of my students to write like this. And he put a whole new ending, which was just hammering uh, uh, Oswald and, and just patently ridiculous in his attempts to make out certain people like Ruth Payne to be angels and Oswald to be this uh, no good, you know, horrible person. Um, here's he is crossing out big things and notes on the side and um, so forth. And um, uh, there's a thing in here somewhere where he says, uh, uh, there, there's a thing about a period where Oswald didn't do anything bad. <laughs> he didn't do anything bad. He didn't beat his wife that week. He didn't uh, do anything reprehensible or express his support for the uh, Shining Path or somebody who hadn't existed yet. Um, yeah, but what he did uh, was nothing. And so Dulles, they write that there was a period of quiet in his life. And Dulles writes, probably due to the fact that he must have been depressed and therefore unable to do his usual bad things. Okay. Uh, here uh, he, adds, he's a, he adds the words, he's a mediocrity and a failure. Now, keep in mind, here's a guy who never finished school, speaks fluent Russian, uh, takes care of his family, holds down these jobs, uh, uh, you know, takes the bus to work, uh, very articulate. I mean, we've heard, uh, uh, where is his Russian friend? Is he here? Mr. Okay, uh, uh, right, Mr. Titovitz. Uh, and he can tell you what a bright soul Lee Harvey Oswald was. Uh, you hear that tape of him where they're joking that they're radio announcers. I mean, really, sort of a likable, charming fellow, nothing like what we were told. Um, oh God, all right, well, I, oh, must be depressed, there it is. <laughs> okay, all right, and then what happened was, the way I got into this was, I was writing a book about the Bush family, I wanted to figure out what had happened to America. I wanted to figure out how do we end up with George W. Bush. See, I always start with the big questions. That was, something doesn't make any sense, like, or who is Barack Obama, you know? I'm always interested in those things, and people always go, who cares? And when I was working on the Bush book, people said, nobody's interested in Bush. We, we, he's already been president. I said, yeah, but I, I don't get what happened to this country. So I started digging into him. And the more I dug into him, I found all these mysteries. Uh, and the more I looked at the mysteries, I, I became interested in his father, because his father was always covering up and cleaning up for the son. And I was struck by the fact that the father was so able to do this that he seemed to have some amazing pull even back in the uh, late 60s when he was 
you know, not even a congressman or just being elected as a congressman. He had this tremendous pull to make records disappear and so forth, allow the son to go AWOL and get away with it. I said, well, how do you do that? So I said, I'm going to have a look at the father. Because if I'm wondering how the son became president, how about, how did the father become president? Because, you know, we like to, nowadays it's fashionable to say that, well, the son was a nim nincompoop, but the father was really what a statesman he was. Well, I remember not only that he threw up on the Japanese prime minister and he had trouble with that vision thing, but really he was not really that impressive, if, to, if I may use understatement. And so I wondered how he became president, and I went back and I looked at the whole thing, and boy was I in for a surprise. I discovered that George H.W. Bush, uh, just as there were many things I found out about the son we didn't know about, the son turns out to be much more formidable a character than we knew, and the father turns out to be vastly more formidable. One of the things I, that struck me about the father was that he was director of the CIA with no experience. We'll get into that very briefly. And I wondered why would they take him right during the church hearings, right when they, the, the agency faces possible dismantlement, wouldn't you take the most articulate, experienced, knowledgeable person you could find? The media didn't think this was strange that they took a guy who, when he was the ambassador in China, do you, do you know what they wrote about him with the New York Times when he was running for, I mean, when he became CIA director, the New York Times was trying to find something to say about his ambassadorship or envoyship, and they wrote that he was famed for throwing barbecues in Beijing, and he and Barr would ride their bikes around and wave at people. I kid you not. So I said, there's something weird about this guy, and then I found out, you all probably know this, that he was asked during an interview, what do you remember about the day Kennedy was shot? Where were you when you heard, and what were your memories? And he wasn't expecting that question, and he had no answer. He claimed he could not remember where he was. And of course, I always ask audiences, so I will ask you too, how many of you were five years old or over on November 22, 1963? Raise your hand. Of those of you who were five or over, uh, keep your hand up if you don't remember where you were when you had about the Kennedy assassination. Okay, I've done this probably a hundred times there was once one very elderly lady who said she didn't remember where, where she had been, but I realized she didn't know where she was at the time. Okay, so, um, so I was interested in that, and I thought, well, I'm just going to figure out, since I'm writing a book about the Bush family, where was George H.W. Bush at the time? And this is how I got interested in the Kennedy assassination, and I, maybe I regret it because I don't think you can ever get out of this thing. Okay, this is the Bush family uh, business, Brown Brothers Harriman, the most powerful, um, uh, most powerful private investment banking firm, still around at Wall Street with the same offices, still very private, never in the news, uh, handling the money of very, very powerful people discreetly. Uh, this is Zapata Offshore, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, oil uh, company of George H.W. Bush, which I discovered when I looked into it that they practically never seem to turn a profit, and as you'll see in Family of Secrets. By the way, they do have copies here, and I will sign copies after this. Uh, they, I interviewed one of his top lieutenants, and I said, what did, what did you consider your job to be? He said, well, uh, he said, well, Poppy wanted us always to be out having lunch with important people and finding out what they thought. And I said, really, for an oil company? <laughs> I don't get that. And of course, they had offices in places like Medellin, Colombia, which was uh, a neither an important uh, oil spot, nor was it even on the coast, and they were an offshore drilling company. So none of it made a lot of sense. One of their sta uh, staff people told me that what his job was was to set up offshore bank accounts in uh, scores of countries. Uh, George H.W. Bush with President Eisenhower, very influential, even before he was in anybody when he was young and in the oil business. He could get that kind of an audience. And if you wonder who Ike was talking about when he was referring to the military industrial complex, look no further than to the man next to him. Okay, here's a, a Ke President Kennedy and Prescott Bush, the grandfather, Senator Bush uh, at Yale, uh, getting honorary degrees. Prescott not too happy that Kennedy's there because he's a Harvard man. Uh, this is the famous memorandum uh, uh, showing that George H.W. Bush on November 22, 1963 called uh, the FBI, wanted to remain unidentified, to say that he had a tip on who might have shot the president. He's calling at 1.45 p.m. on November 22. The same man who separately says he can't remember where he was, here he says, I'm in Tyler, Texas, a.k.a. not in Dallas. 
Um, and we could talk later if you want about this thing. I eventually concluded, and there's a whole chapter on this in Family of Secrets, that it was a red herring designed for him to, uh, uh, to create an alibi that he was somewhere other than Dallas. We'll see why that was the case. Also, as you may have seen, there's a photo going around on the internet of a man who certainly bears a striking resemblance to him standing in front of the uh, TSBD. Also, you may know that uh, a man was stopped exiting the Daltex building. Uh, they let him go when he said he was an independent oil man from Houston. Here's what I found. I thought this was quite a breakthrough. This is uh, uh, where George Bush was the night before in Dallas at a hotel. a meeting which was unnecessary and scheduled rather late in the game. George de Morenschild. So I got interested in George de Morenschild because George de Morenschild was Lee Harvey Oswald's closest friend in America. And Lee Harvey Oswald was like an uncle to him. He and his wife uh, drove them to the dentist and uh, babysat and took them to dinners and all sorts of things. Uh, naturally, since Oswald was a hardcore, uh, at least Trotskyite, and George de Morenschild was a titled uh, white Russian, right wing Morenschild problem. Uh, here's Katzenbach and Johnson settling on the need for a commission. I think you all know the back story that this was forced on them by the establishment, by the uh, calls coming in from uh, a CIA-connected columnist uh, and by uh, various of the wise men, uh, the people who uh, translated the wishes of the, uh, uh, the wealthy 1% uh, of 1% of 1% to government. And they said there was need for a commission in order to uh, uh, satisfy the public. Otherwise, they would never be satisfied. Johnson with Dulles down on the range. Uh, here are the justices, Earl Warren and a man named Tom Clark uh, in the corner there. Tom Clark uh, is one of the people who advocated for Albert Jenner to be hired on the commission. Tom Clark was attorney general uh, uh, under Truman. Uh, and was a very, very close with LBJ, going way back. And his son, by the way, uh, Ramsey Clark, uh, who became Attorney General under Johnson, and although thought of as a peacenik and so on in later years, uh, did not take an interest in investigating uh, the Kennedy assassination. Uh, Albert Jenner. Uh, now, I want to read you a little bit of, how are we doing on time, by the way? I know everything's running late. Okay, well, if somebody wants me to, you want me to rush or? No, no? okay. Okay. Um, uh, so let me just read you briefly about Albert Jenner from Family of Secrets. It's about uh, DeMore and Sheldon Jenner. During the 1950s, as petroleum reserves in the Southwest declined, oilmen there were looking to the Southern Hemisphere for new opportunities. George DeMorenschild, who always seemed to move at the behest of people of higher rank than himself, Turn to Cuba. Okay, big picture. Why are we interested in George de Morenschild? He's the uh, elder statesman in Lee Harvey Oswald's life. George de Morenschild, I find, always answering to people more powerful than himself. He later told the Warren Commission that he left the Buckley's Pantopec Oil, William F. Buckley. William F. Buckley uh, later very reluctantly uh, outed as a former CIA. Uh, actually employee prior to leaving and going into journalism where he all, what he did was to support the CIA relentlessly. Um, uh, he, so the Buckley's Pantopec Oil, uh, after a falling out the company president, yet by 1950 he was working with his former boss again on a new firm called the Cuban Venezuelan Oil Voting Trust Company. Now these things, probably unless you read the book you never heard of this, because I never heard of it, I just happened to find it in obscure clippings. This is important. Uh, in passing, de Morenschild mentioned to the commission that this uh, company had managed to obtain leases covering nearly half of Cuba. Lee Harvey Oswald's friend has half the oil leases in Cuba when uh, Castro topples the apple cart. He appears to have been telling the truth, but Warren Commission Counsel Albert Jenner did not find this remarkable fact interesting and literally rushed on to another topic. This showed that de Morenschild was no rogue operator or bohemian, as Jenner repeatedly sought to characterize him, and as Dulles repeatedly writes, an interesting fellow, no doubt. 
Uh, rather, he was at the center of a major corporate effort involving many of America's largest institutions. Through connections in the Batista regime, the CVOVT had managed to corner exclusive exploration rights to millions of acres on the island. Like all foreign businesses operating in Cuba, it had to work through the dictator's American intermediaries, notably the mobster Meyer Lansky, who was de facto representative of American interests on the island. So George de Morenschild had to deal with Lansky in order to get this deal, okay? Again, none of this interesting to the Warren Commission. What's going on in this period? A little bit of background on Albert Jenner. Um, 19, I wanna go back to the 40s quickly under Truman because that's when the national security state emerges. You all know that. Uh, the background very quickly, 1946 uh, midterm elections. Uh, there's Truman as president, but the Republicans take over both houses of Congress and they are hitting him very, very hard about being weak on communism. Okay, well, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not even a quarter of the way through. Uh, Jim, can I take about three more minutes or no? Okay, uh, okay, let me see how I skip all of this. Uh, anyway, Jenner gets brought on to the uh, National Loyalty Commission. Uh, that's his, his uh, handler, Henry Crown, one of the uh, most prominent businessmen in America. Uh, he uh, was essentially had connections to people connected to the mob. Uh, he took over General Dynamics, which was one of the largest defense contractors. Uh, they got a contract they shouldn't have gotten. Uh, according to Bobby Baker, Lyndon Johnson was paid $100,000 to arrange this. There were investigations going on by the Kennedy administration uh, into all of this stuff at the time of Kennedy's death. After Kennedy's death, all the investigations went away and they continued on their merry way. Um, Bobby Baker. Uh, Bobby Baker scandal, Life Magazine, that's the day of Kennedy's assassination about the Bobby Baker scandal about to break. Um, Connolly, Navy Secretary, and then Fred Korth, both uh, Johnson allies, they're the ones who approved the contract. Uh, 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 Roswell Gilpatrick, uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, worked for General Dynamics right before he presided over all the Cuba stuff for Kennedy. Uh, uh, Exner, uh, General Dynamics, uh, burglarized her apartment trying to get dirt on John Kennedy in order to influence uh, his investigation. Um, Jake Arvey, a major figure in Chicago and the business partner of Henry Crown, connected in with Lansky and all of that crowd. Um, uh, Alan Dorfman, more uh, uh, mob connected people. Albert Jenner represented him. Uh, Meyer Lansky connected into this group. Um, Jack Ruby connected into this group. This is where I'm going, so I'll just wrap it up. Jack Ruby deeply connected into drugs, as was this group. Uh, the Dallas establishment, very much connected, kills him. Uh, Warren Commission, nothing to see here, folks. None of this is interesting or suspicious. Uh, Paynes are A-OK, -okay. no reason to look at Ruth Payne. Uh, Payne was kindly. There's Gilpatrick and Johnson, very happy. The whole thing's been put behind him. Kennedy is dead. Uh, there's Jackie now pur purportedly dating Gilpatrick, the uh, G General Dynamics guy after Bo Jack is dead. Uh, then the Bushes come to power. He's ahead of the CIA, covers it up. George Morenschild is either killed or supposedly killed himself when the HSCA wished to interview him. Mr. Blakey and his uh, people uh, sent uh, somebody to, sent to s summon him and he suddenly decided supposedly to kill himself. Uh, Bush as vice president, uh, then Reagan is shot by a friend of the Bush family, uh, who's a lone nut, and then, uh, then later he becomes president, his son becomes president, Obama becomes president, uh, and there's uh, Henry Crown's son at a big Obama event. Uh, there's Obama starting new wars, there's the defense industry profits over the last number of years, Jeb Bush running for president. Thank you very much.